tonight, no ma'am, no ma'am. Just go. It's free, no tickets. Um, I will say, I don't want to. I don't want to miss this. We have we have birthday, Weetzie Fletcher. Happy birthday to you. Thank you for celebrating your birthday with us. Marilyn Morgan's birthday was yesterday. And David's is third. Well, that we're not. We'll do. We'll deal with that next week then. Uh, no. So, so right now, I'm just going to say a blanket, happy birthday, but especially to Wheatsy and Marilyn, because theirs is this weekend. They actually, you know, they beat you all right now. So anyway, um, I say that this is, it's a good because today we're talking about the unforgivable sin. So that, that's going to be, uh, it's good that we're, we're talking about something uh, lighthearted on Wheatsy's birthday and, and on the weekend of Marilyn's birthday, something really lighthearted. Before we do that, I want to just kind of touch base on uh, one of the topics that we have been dealing with the last several weeks, was the, which is the rejection of Jesus. Um, he, he begins to face different levels of rejection uh, as his ministry increases. And as we always kind of note, the irony of the rejection that Jesus faces is typically in concert with some of miraculous healing. But Jesus faces rejection from three different groups of people, primarily that we've seen so far in Matthew's gospel. And the first is one that is kind of surprising to us, is that Jesus faces a type of rejection. It's not an outright rejection, but it's at least um, a curiosity about the nature of Jesus' work, even from his allies. Um, we've seen this in conversations that Jesus and his disciples have with John the Baptist's disciples. In uh, chapter 9, uh, verse 14 and following, they question Jesus about the practice of fasting and the fasting routine of the disciples. In Matthew chapter 11, uh, John actually sends his disciples to test the legitimacy of Jesus in his lordship and his messiahship. And, and the reason that they have this, and again, it's not quite a rejection, but it is sort of a, a, a curiosity or um, a, a skepticism is probably a better way to put it. And, and it's based on the fact that they have this idea of what the Messiah is supposed to be and what the Messiah is supposed to do, and Jesus breaks that mold. He doesn't come in with uh, armies of people to kick out the Romans or to purify the religious uh, practices and the religious leadership. That, that's, a, that's an ultimate kind of reality that will come in Jesus' second coming, but what Jesus came to do and to be doesn't jive with what they expect, and so they, they face Jesus with some amount of skepticism and curiosity. The most obvious place that Jesus faces rejection is from what group? The Pharisees and the religious leaders. So we'll just, we'll just say blanket religious leaders. And yes, from his hometown for sure, but the religious leaders are probably the most uh, outwardly hostile to, to Jesus. And, and what happens with Jesus uh, and, and his relationship with the religious leaders as a group is that the, the rejection kind of ramps up. It's a progressive sort of thing. And so at the beginning... They, they push back against some of his teaching. They, they begin to question some of his practices. And then ultimately, like we saw last week, they plan uh, his, 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 they're starting to plan his crucifixion. Um, they reject Jesus because of his practices. On the one hand, he, he, he doesn't hang out with the religious leaders. He doesn't associate with them. Who does he associate with? Who does Jesus primarily associate with? Sinners and tax collectors, because tax collectors are even worse than sinners today and back then. No, I'm just playing. But that's who Jesus hangs, hangs out with, and they, they can't understand that. Why does he do that? He must himself be a sinner. You know, it's, it's that old saying, what happens when, uh, when you lie down with dogs? What do you get up with? Fleas. And so that's the kind of mentality that they bring to Jesus' associations. They also don't, uh, don't like what Jesus is teaching. He, he teaches uh, 
a type of, of law that speaks less to behavior, does speak to behavior, but it's more concerned with heart-level motivations. Jesus also says things that, that cause the religious leaders to believe he's actually a sinner. The most, prime, uh, the most common example, uh, or the first example, is when Jesus forgives the sins of someone who's, who comes for healing. And who's allowed to forgive sins? Only God, which is true. The Pharisees say, who can forgive sins but God? And, and that's a true statement. But what they don't accept is that Jesus is God. And so if you don't accept that Jesus is God, and Jesus then pronounces forgiveness of sins, what is Jesus doing? He's blaspheming, which is the worst of sins. And not only that, Jesus begins to teach things that seem to, and we talked about this last week, it's not actual, but it seems to contradict the law. Because what does Jesus do on the Sabbath? He allows his disciples to harvest wheat or glean from a field. He heals on the Sabbath. He's doing work on the Sabbath. And Jesus helps them reorient their, their, their mindset around the Sabbath. But do they accept that? No, because again, they don't accept that Jesus is in fact God. The third group of people that tend to reject Jesus, or we've seen reject Jesus um, in Matthew's gospel, are, and I'm just going to say, people that are on the periphery. These are people that, they hear Jesus uh, teaching, they, they see Jesus' miraculous work, and there's some curiosity, but ultimately they reject, reject him. Uh, we saw this in Matthew chapter 8, and verse 34, Jesus heals some demon-possessed men in the Gentile area of the Gadarenes. And what do they uh, tell Jesus uh, to do after he has healed these men and sent the demons into the pigs? What do the people of Gadarenes tell him to do? Leave. Get out of town. Now, if they're pig farmers, you kind of understand that. You know, they're pig herders. Is it farmers or herders? Probably herders. Um, but they've just witnessed a miracle. And yet, that does not compel them. And, and, and throughout, if you look at all the Gospels, there are these groups of people. Probably, you could probably categorize other groups that reject Jesus. But these are the three primary groups of people that reject Jesus. It's the, the allies, which is more of a skepticism. They come around, ultimately, or eventually. Uh, but they do approach Jesus with a certain skepticism. There are people that are the, the religious leaders, the most primary example. And then those on the periphery. And when I think about the folks on the periphery, I would even say the Roman government that ultimately has Jesus executed falls into that camp. Because like Pontius Pilate rejects Jesus, but it's, he doesn't really understand what's going on, nor does he care. Nor does he care. He sees an innocent man, but the death of this innocent man leads to what he believes will be more kind of social stability. So he's rejecting Jesus, but not for any good reason. So this is the type of G uh, rejection that Jesus typically faces. And we talked last week about the reasons uh, behind that as well. So we get into uh, Matthew chapter uh, 12, verse 22. After Jesus has uh, been chastised for his, um, for his, his rejection, what they think is a rejection of the Sabbath commands, um, we talked last week about the, the secret messiahship of, of Jesus as well. But then we get into uh, verse 22, Matthew chapter 12. A demon, possessed ma a, a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him. That's Jesus. And he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed. And they said, can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it's only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? 
then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. So, the teaching that Jesus gives, beginning in verse 25, is set out because of a healing miracle. It's a, it's a very reminiscent scene. We've seen, uh, it, as, as the one in chapter 9, verse 32 through 34, if you look there, G, G, Jesus heals a demon-possessed man. Here, the man is demon-possessed, and he's also mute and blind. The language suggests that the reason this man is mute and blind is because of the demon. It's not as though he was born blind and mute and then was oppressed by this demon, but it suggests that the, the two kind of physical afflictions were caused by the demon possession. Now, some people look at this passage in Matthew 12 and they look back at the passage in Matthew 9 and think that this is a doublet. Do you guys know what a doublet is? Have I explained what a doublet is? Have I explained that? You've forgotten. Okay, that's fine. So a doublet, and you actually can have a... Thank you for being honest, Jeff. Um, a, a doublet or a triplet um, is basically the idea that you see um, two narrative passages in Scripture that are very similar such that biblical scholars, critical biblical scholars, especially those who um, hold to redactor theory, which I'm not going to get into that, um, they believe that it's not actually two separate incidents, it's one incident repeated, it's doubled. So there are some that look at, and, and you can imagine what a triplet is then, right? So for example, not just in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, you see this um, happen uh, in the life of Abraham. Abraham uh, goes to Pharaoh with his wife Sarah, even though she's pushing 85 or 90 years old. Uh, Abraham is very concerned that she is so beautiful that the people in uh, Egypt are going to take her as their wife and kill Abraham. And so what does he say? Not my wife. She's my sister. Well, there's a similar scene later with Abimelech. And so critical scholars will say this is actually the same incident repeated twice, but just reframed in order to move the, 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 the story forward. Now, uh, most of the time, that, is, that, that, that view is, is a fabrication of what's actually going on. It, it, can two things, similar uh, things, happen to a person? Yes, and in fact, the two similar things might represent, might be presented in order to show us a pattern of, of behavior of both God and his people. So this is what we see with, it, with Matthew chapter 9 and then Matthew chapter 12. Is it possible that Jesus healed two demon-possessed man at different times and in different locations that are afflicted with similar things? Yes. It says that Jesus went to an area and healed everybody. So the, the charge that this is a doublet doesn't really hold up at all. Um, doesn't matter anyhow. I mean, I, I think the, to me, I think it's important to see that Jesus has a pattern of behavior and that the pattern of behavior represents uh, something of who Jesus is and his, the inbreaking of the kingdom. Matthew's presenting it this way to show us that very thing. Uh, I think, does it, does, if we accept that the word of God is true in all of its forms, then we have to accept what it says to us. Now, do we have to accept the total historicity of every single point in the way that we judge historicity? No, because we're 21st century North American Christians in Central Florida, and our standard for history is different than the standard of someone like Matthew, or Mark, or Luke, or John, for that matter. Uh, but this really shows us that Jesus was routine. 
you got to think about Jesus' life. We think of Jesus as a teacher, but when you read this back to back to back, what is Jesus doing all the time? He's healing people. I mean, and you understand why. If, if you knew a person who could do what Jesus did, how many people would be lining up? And that's and 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 pre-internet days, this is like this is the whole world. This is people lining up to see Jesus. So this is just to say that that's a pattern. The, so Jesus uh, performs the miracle, casts out the demons. The man can speak and see. Notice how little real estate the actual healing takes up in this miracle. One verse. One verse. And, 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 and when you look at a lot of the miracles of Jesus, it takes one verse. Why? Because how much, how much, uh, how much ink does it take to say Jesus said it and it was so? Or Jesus touched the man and it was so. This time he doesn't say that he touched the man, it just says he healed him. So that he, the man spoke and saw. Now, what, what is the reaction of the crowd? Remember, we talked about the people on the periphery, but what are the people on the periphery doing at this point? Are they rejecting Jesus? No, what are they doing? They're seeing the miracle, and like people who have a brain, they're like, wait a minute, this guy might be special. Could he be the son of David? Again, that is a title of messiahship, because there was the anticipation that the messiah would come from the line of David and, and fulfill the covenant that was spoken to David that there would be a descendant of David on the throne of God's kingdom. And that the sign of the miracle was, was potentially a sign of that, that, that position and that uh, title. And so the people on the periphery are asking, could this actually be the son of David? Could this be the Messiah? He's got the, he's got the credentials in terms of what he can do. But what do the Pharisees say? Yeah, there's no way this guy's the son of David. He cast out demons by Beelzebul. Now, what follows is a parallel to Luke chapter 11, verse 14, which is a really close parallel, and Mark chapter 3. But rather than the teaching of Jesus uh, following, a, uh, following the demon-casting episode in Mark's gospel... What Jesus teaches here follows the calling of the disciples and the attempt of Jesus' family to take him home because they think he is out of his mind. So Jesus begins to teach about uh, the house divided and the unforgivable sin based on the fact that his family comes to take him because they think he's out of his mind. That's in Mark's gospel. So Jesus' words after this healing is a very famous rebuttal regarding the unforgivable sin. Now, he uses a couple of images to describe this, this sin first. First, he talks about a kingdom and then a house to illustrate that things or, or organizations uh, that want to, to, to succeed, they work towards that success. If there's a division, the kingdom or the household Large entities, small entities, they will fail. So if you have infighting in a company, especially in upper management, you guys that are in business, what happens? Is that company on the path to success or failure? It's definitely not on the path to, to success. If there's widespread infighting, widespread disagreement on vision and mission and, 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 and direction, the, the house is divided against itself. The same thing is true of governments. And we see this worldwide. We see when governments are fighting against themselves about what is the priority, the, the governments tend to flounder. So Jesus is laying this out as just logic. He's like, look, this is logic. This is not, he's not talking about anything deeply spiritual at this point. He's saying, look at how society works. And, and so what the Pharisees are saying is absolute, cannot cannot, cannot uh, uh, be true. Now, what Jesus also says is picked up by uh, one of the most famous uh, figures in our American, in our history, and that is, anybody know? Who, who, who quoted this? Abraham Lincoln quotes this in reference to the Civil War. He was looking at the Civil War, the potential uh, fighting of the Civil War, and he knew this is going to end badly. 
we have to be united ultimately. He used this after accepting the Republican nomination for a Senate seat in Illinois. Uh, Stephen Douglas, the incumbent, it's actually funny, I'm, this must have been in my head when I wrote my sermon for today, because I talk about Stephen Douglas and Abraham Lincoln in my sermon for today. Um, Douglas advocated for the state's rights and individual sovereignty uh, so that they could either be slave states or free states. And so with that backdrop, Lincoln uh, uh, gives a speech with the words, a house divided against itself cannot stand. He said, look, this is a fundamental ideological principle, slavery versus uh, freedom, and we cannot have both in the same house. This is going to lead to war, civil war, and it, it ultimately did. Uh, so when Jesus originally spoke the words about divided kingdoms and divided houses, he was saying that Satan is not going to work against his own success, and that if Jesus is casting out demons, taking away their power over an individual, it doesn't make sense that Satan would be, or Beelzebul would be behind that. Beelzebul is an ancient uh, way of describing uh, Satan. It, it goes back to uh, the Baal uh, the, the Baal uh, uh, um, gods of, of the Canaanites. Satan's goal is to do what? Divide and conquer. Bind and kill and destroy the people of God. And, and, and really everybody. That's Satan's goal. To take people prisoner of their own brokenness. So why would Satan free someone from their brokenness? Why would he do that? It does not make sense. Uh, basically what, what Jesus is saying is Satan is vile, Satan is evil, but Satan is not stupid. He's not going to work against his own success. And so what Jesus imagines is the whole world as the house of Satan. Now that, that he's using this metaphorically, okay? He's imagining that the, this world is broken and actually... Uh, he, it, Satan is called the, the prince of the, the air, and, and, and there is authority that's given. And then he admits that Satan is strong, and yet Jesus has come into the house. And so Jesus is coming to take back the house, and Jesus is stronger. And so what does Jesus come to do? He comes to bind up the strong man and then plunder the house, which is a very odd thing, metaphorically, to just think of Jesus as being a plunderer of a house and binding up the strong man. But that's what he came to do to defeat all the effects of the brokenness of this world, all the effects of sin. That's what the, the miracles are about. That's what the healings are about. He's declaring that the broken rule of Satan is over. And the kingdom of the fall is on the way out. So the kingdom of God has come in Jesus Christ. Yes, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Well, so what Jesus is, yeah, so what Jesus is doing here, though, is not saying. In, it's, it's more of a, it's, what Jesus is doing is more pointing to the sign of the ultimate rule of the kingdom of God, right? So the ultimate rule of the kingdom of God is one of wholeness, is one of uh, freedom, it's one of, of salvation. And in the miracles of Jesus, he's pointing to the time when that is an ultimate reality. You notice he doesn't say anything about the man's sins. He doesn't say anything about the man's sins. Well, we don't know how the man responds. This is one of those cases where we don't actually see what, how the man responds. There are times when people are healed by Jesus and then are still skeptics. We can think in John's gospel where uh, there are times where uh, there actually, John actually creates um, a contrast between people that are healed and accept and follow Jesus and then those who remain somewhat skeptical about Jesus, which is... We, we think it's kind of odd when a Pharisee looks at a healing miracle and still rejects Jesus. It's even more odd when Jesus actually heals a person and then they don't immediately follow him, right? But there are cases where that happens, especially in John's gospel. 
But here the point is not the man's salvation or not salvation. The point is what the healing is about. And the healing and all the healing miracles are about Jesus' ultimate work over all the effects of sin and brokenness in the world. Now, is that is the work of Jesus totally accomplished, or are we waiting, it, waiting for it to be uh, fulfilled or co- uh, completed? Yeah, well, it, it's kind of a both and, right? Jesus' life, death, and resurrection seals the reality of salvation and wholeness for the world. That is done. That's accomplished. It can't be overturned. But in the meantime, we're still living with the effects of the fall with the, as we've been talking about in this entire sermon series, the future hope of the culmination or the, the, the theological word is the consummation of the kingdom. We're in this in-between time where the work of Jesus is done, but it's not totally complete. So we call this the already It's already done, but it's not yet complete. So the already and not yet. That's the time that we live in now. So the the healing miracles point to the reality where Satan will have no dominion over anything. And so Jesus heals the man, takes the dominion of the demon out of the man as a sign to that ultimate reality. Does that make sense? That's a lot, but that's, that's... And that's why Jesus says, look... A house divided. Satan is not going to be casting out demons. If anything, he's trying to find ways to put more demons in people. That's what, that's what Satan would be all about. He's not about to authorize some, some human being to be taking demons out when he's trying to put demons in. When he's trying to enforce the effects of the fall. So when you take this lesson from Matthew's gospel and then you look at uh, Mark chapter 9 and then Luke chapter 9, uh, some of the parallel uh, lessons, Jesus turns the table by saying those who are not for Jesus are against Jesus. This is an indictment against the Pharisees who are making the accusation. Is there a middle ground when it comes to faith in Jesus Christ? Can you kind of sort of be for Jesus? No. The Doobie brothers were wrong. Jesus can't just be all right. You guys know that song? Jesus is just all right with me. You guys know? Look it up. It's good. Um, But it's wrong. Jesus can't just be all right. You're either in or you're out. And the Pharisees were definitely out. We cannot be kind of sort of in with Jesus, but not. It's like some people that say, well, I, I, I think Jesus was a great moral philosopher. And I think he was a great teacher. But... Ah, the son of God, the savior of the, I don't, you know, I don't believe that. Well, guess what? You don't get that because if you believe Jesus was a great teacher, that means you believe that what he taught was true. And guess what he taught? That he was the son of God and the savior of the world. If you don't buy that part of it, then you don't buy the other part of it either. Because if Jesus isn't the son of God and the savior of the world, then he was a liar. So you have to, you you either take the whole package or you take none of it. You don't get to pick and choose. I know some people don't like that, but that's just the way it is. That's the way it is. Well, some of them we know, I mean, we're not told in this particular instance, like how they, how they were thinking through it, but we do know some of the religious leaders did come to faith in Jesus. And, and like Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea, who were in that kind of religious elite camp, they struggled with, with Jesus, but I, I, and this is me talking, this is not, we don't have any evidence of this in the scripture, but we do know Nicodemus came to Jesus with questions in, in John chapter 3. There was a curiosity, but he wasn't all in just yet. But we do know by the end of the gospel that when Jesus is hanging on the cross, it's Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea that run the risk of ceremonially becoming ceremonially unclean by dealing with the body the day before the Sabbath, meaning they could not worship on the Sabbath because they were ceremonially unclean and could not get themselves clean and were publicly declaring their allegiance to this dead Messiah. 
So what, what changes in John, from John 3 to the end of the Gospels? Well, I think this is part of it, to your point. I think this is one of those things where the religious leaders are hearing it, and some of them are like, wait a minute. All these guys are saying that he's casting out demons by, by Beelzebub, but he's making a lot of sense here, <laughs> you know? And, oh, by the way, he's, he's, he's giving sight to the blind. He's making the mute talk. I mean, that ought to... He didn't have, Jesus shouldn't have had to say anything, right? I mean, the actions speak louder than words, which is what he talks about later with the tree and the fruit, which we're not going to get into today. So this brings Jesus to the topic of the unforgivable sin. So I read a, a story from the Reformed Baptist pastor, John Piper. And, and he, he tells the story based on this passage. He says that a young woman came to his office and told him how one day, when she was a young teenager, she got so angry at her mother, who was a Christian, that she locked herself in a room and used every swear word and oath and every foul language that she could against the Holy Spirit that she could think of. And that day, as a teenager, was like tattooed on her brain and on her conscience. And it came back to haunt her again and again. She thought that she maybe had committed the unforgivable sin. She was terrified that she could not be forgiven because later on she came to understand her mother wasn't a total idiot and that maybe Jesus was the Son of God and Savior of the world. She wanted to come to faith, but she felt like maybe she was unqualified because of this, this moment. And it was kind of a natural fear because this whole idea can be confusing if we divorce what Jesus is saying about the Holy Spirit from the context of Jesus' ministry. What Jesus says about the unforgivable sin actually begins with a word of assurance. Look at what he says. In verse 31, he says, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. So how does he start? How many sins and how many blasphemies will be forgiven? All of them. So that is a word of assurance, right? That's how he begins this, this, this brief little statement. Whatever blasphemies, all sins. And how, what does all mean? Everything. All means all, right? So... Whatever sins a person has committed, whatever sins I have committed, they are not outside the, the reach of the forgiveness of God. The cross of Jesus is here for every sin, and there are no sins that are so heinous that God's love is not bigger still. Yes. No, 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 we're getting there. Jesus says there's something that will be unforgiven, but we're going to get there. But he says all sins, so this is, this, is, this, is where, this is where some people say, well, Zach, you can't have it both ways. There's either all sins or there's one sin, right? So we're going to get to why the one unforgivable sin actually leads to the unforgiveness of all sins for an individual. Because it, it comes down to what the Holy Spirit came to do, okay? So in John chapter, uh, uh, in, or in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, it summarizes Jesus' uh, ministry this way. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The good news is that all sins will be forgiven and the path of living into that forgiveness is repentance. Repentance is the path to forgiveness. Repentance leads us to Jesus Christ or Jesus Christ leads us to repentance is really probably the better way to put it. And when we repent and turn from our sins, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. What John says in his uh, letter. Now, this is what happens in a person when they are forgiven of their sins. And that's what it it feels like I look at this at my sin, I look at the state of sin in my life, and I turn. But what prompts me to turn? Why? Why do I look? Why is it that I look at my sin and I say, 
you know what, I realize this is wrong. I need to turn and face, turn from my sin and face God and walk towards it. What is it that prompts me to do that? No. no. The Holy Spirit. On my own, I will never choose God. Never, ever, 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 ever on my own. This Bible says it a thousand times. I'm never, I will never choose God on my own. The Holy Spirit has, and what's the Holy Spirit, by the way? What is the Holy Spirit? God. We always forget that third part of the Trinity. It is a Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's God. Unless God prompts me to turn, I'm not going to turn and repent and be forgiven of my sins. John chapter 16, verse 7 and 8, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. He's talking to his disciples. For if I do not go away, the helper, the parakletos, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So what's the Holy Spirit doing? Convicting the world of sin and and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit leads us to turn from sin and simultaneously turn toward Jesus. Later in John's gospel, Jesus says it's the Spirit that reminds us of Jesus' words in our lives. So to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit is to actively resist the leading of the Spirit to Jesus. So if forgiveness is given to us by Jesus when we repent and turn toward Jesus and we resist the leading of the Holy Spirit, can we be forgiven of any of our sins? No. That's just logic, right? Because if the Holy Spirit is the one that, that leads us on the path of repentance toward God, through the person and work of Jesus resisting the Holy Spirit, which is blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, is resisting the turning, and, and the path to forgiveness is that way. If I am, am just like in lockstep where I'm not going to turn, I'm not going to be forgiven. So blaspheming or resisting the Holy Spirit leads to the unforgiveness of all of our sins. No, the Holy Spirit is the thing is the is the person that enables us to come to Christ and the thing that enables us to grow in our faith in Jesus Christ. It's both. It's both. Yeah. Terry. Yes. Okay. You know, I think it's really, it's, I think we, that's why I say yes to that question, because I think it's, the work of the Trinity, the Trinitarian relationship in our faith life if we if we try to if we try to put too hard a boundary on it we can get so caught up in the boundary that we forget that 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 it's really not like that you know it's 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 really there's the breaks in the in the the working of the holy spirit and and the work of jesus christ and the work of the father it's like people uh, want to debate like when is the when is the holy spirit when does the holy spirit come on the scene and some people believe that the Holy Spirit doesn't come on the scene until Jesus ascends into heaven. That the Holy Spirit's work on earth does not exist. Well, that's just not true. The Holy Spirit is active throughout the Old Testament. In fact, Genesis chapter 1, what do you see? What do you see, Marilyn? You see all three, and the, the Spirit's 
hovering over the vast void of, cre of pre-creation. And then God speaks. So it's, and again, um, we, we kind of tend to think of like the, the, the corporal reality of God all, all the time. But how does the Bible describe God? God is spirit, right? The only, the only person of the Trinity that definitively has a corporal body is the incarnate Christ, the second person of the Trinity. So I, I, I understand where you're coming from, Terry. I get, I, I get that. It is, and I think it's because our brains don't really like comprehend how the Trinity works within us. And I know some people get real legalistic about, and I'll, I'll, I do this too. I, just let me just say, um, whenever someone prays to the Holy Spirit, I question the legitimacy of it, but I shouldn't. I do, in my heart, because I'm like, I, I was, I was kind of taught, you pray to the Father by the Spirit in the name of the Son. Yeah. Yes, and that's in my brain, and that's in my heart, and that's in my background. But at the same time, the Trinity is, is the Trinitarian relationship is mutual, right? And it's, almost impossible for us to kind of understand and and explain how the 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 relationship in the trinity works without tiptoeing into heresy right without tiptoeing into and and so every time we say something then we have to kind of back off of it and say well yes but right i mean this is why you have the this is why the nicene creed exists because they were for for the first you know several hundred years of Christianity, they were trying to figure out um, the relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and there were those that couldn't wrap their brains around the divinity of Jesus and the humanity of Jesus. This is why you get the language of et eternally begotten of the Father, and the Holy Spirit eternally begotten of the Father and the Son. Well, when we think of begotten, we think of and that's why the word begat is, is a powerful one, because we always think of people having kids, and so that creates this kind of uh, hierarchy of, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But begotten does not really mean, it, it means that, but it doesn't. It means more than that. So we sometimes will say eternally proceeding from. But if it's eternal, it's like if my kids were eternally born of me. Like, that would be like they always existed, but they still proceeded from me. It doesn't, like, in human, in human terms, it doesn't make sense. It can only make sense in the relationship of the Godhead. This is why the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit becomes an unforgivable kind of test because it's resisting, it's resisting the entirety of, of God's work. And, and Jesus applies that to the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit which prompts and indwells the people. That's why he, you know, because if you reject Jesus Christ, is that unforgivable? If you say, I don't believe in Jesus, are you going to heaven or hell? You're going to hell. Can I just, is that too blunt? If you say Jesus is not the Lord, Jesus is not the Son of God, Jesus did not, if you say that, that Jesus did not die on the cross for my sins, are you forgiven of your sins? No, because you haven't accepted the forgiveness. You have not accepted it. But if you change, but then you, you are changing and you're saying then, right? Are you catching me? But the only way you can make that change is by the Holy Spirit prompting you to do so. Now listen, I say this with a great deal of conviction, but do I understand exactly how it works? No. I know it's true, but I don't understand exactly how it works. So, you go back to the girl, the teenage girl. Did she blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? If she ultimately turns and repents of that moment and follows Jesus Christ? No, she doesn't. She did not. She, didn't blasph she did not blaspheme the Holy Spirit in the way Jesus is talking about it here. She cursed at the Holy Spirit, but 
actively resisting the Holy Spirit is acting as though the Holy Spirit doesn't even exist, really. So when, when the, again, context, what is the context of Jesus, of Jesus uh, saying this? The context is the Pharisees are looking at the work of Jesus, which is absolutely good. If you are healing a person of their blindness, of their muteness, casting out a demon, and you're looking at that and saying, that's the work of Satan, you're calling evil good and good evil. The Pharisees are in the act of, we, we think of, sometimes we think of the unforgivable sin as like this, this moment in time, right? This is the time where you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, and that's the, but really, it's more of a progressive thing. Marilyn, what were you going to say? Again, what is it that causes you to change and repent? See, this is the part of Presbyterian theology that we... Exactly. So if you resist the power of the whole... Like, so in, in the sovereign kind of uh, the sovereign plan of God, God knows when the Holy Spirit's going to prompt you to, to repent or not. It doesn't mean that's permanent. Does not, that does not mean it's permanent. But that's why the unforgivable sin is not just a moment in time. Like, this is the moment I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. I cannot be forgiven at that moment. It is a continual attitude. Maybe it starts at one point, and then it, it takes root, and it, it takes root, and it becomes the weed that grows up into your life. And that won't be... Because again... Resisting the Holy Spirit is resisting against the truth about Jesus Christ. You could put it the other way. The unforgivable sin is not believing that you're forgiven of your sins by the power of Jesus Christ. That's the other way you could put it. If you don't believe that you can be forgiven, if you don't believe that there's anything called the forgiveness of sins by the, if you don't believe there's anything called the cross of Jesus, you don't believe there's anything called the resurrection of Jesus, you don't believe in any of that, is Jesus going to say, let me write you a check for your sins now? You don't believe I exist, but I'm going to give you the check anyway? No, 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 no. Again, the whole gift idea, I think, really does work this way. I think this helps. If, if the gift of salvation like, is a physical, if, like, if I have a, a box and I'm tangibly going to give you this gift of salvation, and inside this box is salvation the forgiveness of sins, and I hand it to you, and you look at it and say, I don't believe there's salvation in this box. I don't believe there's forgiveness of sins. I, so I'm not going to open it. Do you receive that salvation or don't you? Do you receive that gift or don't you? So you don't receive forgiveness in that moment. So how can you be forgiven when you don't receive forgiveness? Do you see the logic there? So that's what Jesus is really kind of talking about and, and what and, and what gives us that gift is the Holy Spirit. It's really complicated, guys. It's really complicated. Isaiah 5, chapter 20, or chapter 5, verse 20 and 23. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine, and are valiant men and mixing strong drink, and who acquit the guilty for a bribe and deprive the innocent of his right. The Pharisees and the religious leaders, they are calling evil good and good evil. Have they committed the unforgivable sin yet? They're on their way. John Calvin, when he's thinking of this passage, he says, we need not then wonder if for such sacrilege is there... There is no hope for pardon, for they must be desperate who turn the only medicine of salvation into a deadly venom. That's what the Pharisees and religious leaders are doing. They're looking at the salvation of Jesus and they're saying it's deadly poison. It's no wonder they don't receive 
salvation if they continue to act in that way. They keep rejecting the medicine of salvation. They're ultimately going to die in their unforgiveness. So blaspheming against the Holy Spirit is the way of looking at the work of Christ and not only saying that the work of Christ is evil, but then living as though it is evil. It is a slow process. C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce, he says, For a lost soul is nearly nothing. It is shrunk, shut in itself. Good beats upon the lost incessantly as sound waves beat on the ears of the deaf, but they cannot receive it. Their fists are clenched. Their teeth are clenched. Their eyes fast shut. First, they will not. In the end, they cannot. They can't open their hands for gifts or their mouth for food or their eyes to see. Such is the person who sets themselves against the work of the Holy Spirit over the course of their life. Clear as mud now for you? You got it? Clearer. Well, that's all I can really hope for. It's both and. You know, the, th the funny thing, I want to say the funny thing, the, the thing about all theology is, the clearer some things become, the less clear others become. And that's why the work of, of, of biblical study is lifelong, right? Because it, it comes with those sorts of questions that you're asking. You know, you get to one thing, you feel good about it. You're like, yes, resolution. You're like, what about this, though, over here? And that's kind of where we are. So next week, um, Jesus continues to kind of talk about how we see the work of the Holy Spirit in people's lives through their actions. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for uh, the work of Jesus Christ and ask that as we go about our days, weeks, months, years, and our lives, that we would always be um, uh, people that receive the power of the Holy Spirit influencing us. And we pray for the Spirit's work to be on those um, who do not know you, that they would be uh, convicted to turn and repent towards you. We give you praise and glory for your salvation in Jesus' name. Amen.